Hey everybody, my name's Tim, and it's time to help you choose what's on your table this weekend. Each week we take three games from a certain category and we tell you what they're all about. How many players they're for, how long they take to play, the game mechanics involved, and what we like about the game. All so that way we can help you decide if it's the kind of game that you'd like. Well, why don't we take a walk over to the closet and see what this week's category is. <laughs> Have you ever sat at the table before playing a game and you've just taken your turn and then the wait begins until your next turn? And you wait, and you wait, and you wait some more and you wish you didn't have to wait. Well, this week's episode is just for you. It's all about a mechanic that's called simultaneous action selection, which is just a really, really fancy way of saying everybody takes their turn at the same time so you don't have to wait between your turns. First game this week is Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Now, this is a three to seven player game of light to medium complexity. The time on the box says 45 to 60 minutes. Now, we find it takes about 45 minutes to play. Um, and if you have new players, you should add about five to 10 minutes to your gameplay budget. Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig is a mashup game of the original Castles of Mad King Ludwig by Bezier Games and Between Two Cities by Stonemaier Games. Now, just like in the original castles, each player is a master castle builder who Mad King Ludwig would like to build him a castle. Now, the difference in this game is that instead of building one castle, you're actually going to build two castles, one with each of your neighbors. So the castle here in between me and my neighbor to my right is going to be built by both that person and I, and same goes for this castle on my left. It'll be built between myself and my neighbor to my left. Now, the game is actually pretty simple. There are two rounds, and each round, each player gets a stack of nine of these tiles from the tray. And on each of their turns, they're going to pick two of the tiles that they would like to draft to put in their castles. Now, once they do that, they pass the tiles to their player on the left. So there's a little bit of card drafting or tile drafting in this case. And then once every player has selected at the same time, hence the simultaneous action selection, everybody's gonna reveal their tiles and then there's gonna be conversation at the table between all the neighbors over where each tile should go. Now in this case, we might de decide that the solar is going to go into this castle between myself and my neighbor here. And the tassel room is going to go here between myself and my neighbor here. Once both rounds are finished, you're gonna tally up the points in these castles and they're all gonna be worth different amounts of points based on how you've built them. Now, if I am responsible for two castles and there's one here that gets X number of points and this one gets a different number of points, my score at the end of the game is whichever one of these two castles got the lowest amount of points and then the highest score uh, wins for that player. Now the mechanics in this game are tile placement, card drafting, team-based game, highest lowest scoring so that is the name of the mechanic for um, how you have to take the lowest of your two scores and that's the one that counts and simultaneous action selection now if i had to pick three things that i enjoy most about between two castles of mad king ludwig the first is this is that it's set up that whichever one of the two castles that you're playing on the one that gets the least points is the one that counts as your score it forces you to try on both sides. Um, it's a really, really clever way of making sure that everybody's always giving their best effort possible when they're cooperating with their partners and you can't forcibly sewer one of your neighbors and that makes it a lot more enjoyable as a cooperative game. There's tons of Easter eggs in this game. You know, they had things like um, a game storage room and you could see all the different Stonemeyer games. They had funny themed rooms. They had a kittenry, um, which has uh, Jamie Stegmeyer's kittens in it. Um, there's just lots of fun little Easter eggs in all of the all the rooms that you can look at and that makes the game a lot of fun to look at each tile and see what's on there that captures your eye. The last thing is I love the organization of the game. It makes it so easy to set up and take down the game trays inside of here. Um, they just It makes it so simple for you to have it set up for the next time you play um, and it just makes it a really well organized game that's actually a joy to set up and take down. Next up, we have one of the most modern classic um, card drafting simultaneous action games that there is, and that is Seven Wonders. Now, Seven Wonders is listed as a two to seven player game. You know, if I'm being honest, I don't really, um, I've never actually tried the two player variant. It's actually designed to be a three to seven player game, 
but there is a two-player variant in here as well. Now, it's a light to medium complexity game. The box says it takes about 30 minutes to play around. We find that it takes about 15 to 35 minutes. Now, player count doesn't seem to matter in this game, just like it doesn't in any other simultaneous action game, because everybody's taking their turns at the same time anyway. If you have a new player to this game, I'd recommend adding about five to 10 minutes to explain the game. In Seven Wonders, each player is um, building their own civilization that's centered around one of the seven wonders of the world. Now, it's a card drafting game. So what happens is that the game is played over the course of three rounds, or in this case, ages. And in each age, each player is gonna get a hand of seven cards. So these are the cards for age one. On your turn, you're gonna pick one card that you wanna play into your tableau and everybody's going to pick at the same time and once they've picked they're going to put the um, the hand of cards to their left so that way the next player can grab it and then they'll reveal that card and place it in their tableau now the cards can do different things for you they can be buildings that are going to provide you with different resources like this one is they can provide you with points uh, civilian buildings military might increase your commerce give you some science um, or you can even use those cards to tuck under here and if you have the resources required to do so, build one of the stages of your wonder. So in this case, the Colossus of Rhodes. Now, after the end of the three ages, points are tallied up based on various things. And there's different ways to get victory points, such as completing wonders, collecting lots of uh, different types of science. These blue cards are solely for giving you points. And whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins. Now, the mechanics in Seven Wonders are card drafting, hand management, set collection, variable player powers, and of course, simultaneous action selection. Three things that we have really enjoyed about this game are, well, I mean, the first is that it's addictive. Once you play a game, uh, it's so easy just to reshuffle the cards and start again. It's quick to set up, it's quick to take down, and it's quick to play. When we first got this game, there were many nights that we played the game eight, nine, ten times a sitting because we'd just look at each other after and say, well, want to play again? And everybody would always just say yes because it's so easy. And you always want to keep trying because you want to see what different combinations you can get with your cards each time. Second thing I really enjoy this game is that there's an app for it, the Seven Wonders Companion app, and it actually keeps stats and analytics on the ways each player gets points, how many times they've won, how many times they've lost, um, and it makes the game a lot more fun to look at. Um, the last thing that I really enjoy about this game, and this is just a me thing, I love collecting science cards. There is no greater feeling in the world than the one time I was playing and I managed to get every single science card and I think it was worth 78 points. And I think that it was the best accomplishment that I ever felt that I got in a board game. So for me personally, I just love collecting science. Now our last simultaneous uh, player action game is Steampunk Rally. Now Steampunk Rally is a two to eight player game. Its complexity is medium. Now the box says it takes 45 to 60 minutes. We find an average play for us takes about 56 minutes, regardless again of player count, just like the other games, because everybody's taking their turn at the same time anyways. In Steampunk Rally, players take on the role of a famous inventor, in this case, Albert Einstein and the Wright brothers, uh, tasked with building a racing contraption or a racing machine or vehicle that's going to take them from the start line to the finish line while avoiding certain obstacles along the way. Now at the beginning of each round each player takes a hand of four cards, one from each pile, and there's a draft. So you're going to pick one card from here and you're going to pass it to your player on the left. Now when you decide which card you're going to draft you can either take the cogs on the top and add them to your collection. You can take two dice, so in this case two blue dice, and save them for later. Or you can take the card, like the steam vent, and add it to your machine. After that, we're going to race. Now, when you race, there's certain colors of squares here, and that represents the color of dice that can be applied to that square. So you roll all the dice that you have. So in this case, I've got two blue dice, a six and a four. And on this card here, it says that if I have a blue dice at a value of three or higher, I can go forward a space. So I'm gonna take them both and put them there. Go up two spaces. Now, the game is over once somebody crosses the finish line. At that point, there is one more round, and whoever can get the furthest across the finish line wins. Now, there's a couple things that you need to be careful for. First of all, your vehicle can take damage. If it takes more damage than it can sustain um, through going through, 
through going through some of this hilly terrain, you actually have to shed pieces of your machine. They fall apart and they, they're left on the side of the road. The other thing is that these dice stay in this spot um, until you can get rid of them. So you can't keep using that slot over and over again. And there's a point in the game where you can spend these cogs to lower the value of the dice until they're zero and you can take them off the space. Now the mechanics in Steampunk Rally are dice rolling, race, modular board, card drafting, and of course, simultaneous action selection. Well, if I had to pick three things that I really enjoy about Steampunk Rally, the first would be this. It's, um, it's a rare game that can get up to eight players at it without it being like a party style game, right? So it's kind of a, a game where you have to do a little bit more thinking than a party style game. And there's not a lot of games like that out there that can accommodate eight players. Most eight player games are more of a party style. So it gives you something different that you can do with a larger group without sacrificing time, right? Because it's simultaneous action. The next is that I demonstrated earlier how um, if you take too much damage, your machine starts to actually fall apart and you lose components from your, your racing machine. And it actually is a strategy at times to let your machine fall apart. And it makes it really, really fun to play the game in a way where at times you're trying to build it up and get a bigger engine. And at times you're willing to let it just take damage and fall apart. I find that that concept and that strategy really fits well with the theme because it's about all these inventors trying to basically string together these machines that may or may not work and get them to the finish line. The last thing that I really like about this game is that there's some really good promos out there and different types of expansions such as this. If you're Canadian, you could be famous Canadian Red Green and you can have his van as your vehicle and basically um, you get to use duct tape to string it all together but there's other ones out there too of different inventors and different famous people that you can add to the game and it just makes it fun and it has some of the most fun promos that I've ever seen in the game. Well, that wraps it up for another week here. I hope that you enjoyed learning about all of these games where you don't have to wait to take your turn uh, as much as I enjoyed sharing them with you. You know, if you like this video and you want to see more like this, why don't you hit that subscribe button below and hit the little bell as well so that you get a notification every time we have a new episode. Or why don't you comment below and tell us about your experiences with these games or even better, tell us what's on your table this weekend.